On this episode, we are finally doing shots. Shots, shots, shots. We discuss code that runs only in two environments. In my head, in, in my heart. And we reap the rich harvest of token optimization. <laughs> Hi everybody, this is Christian. Mm. This is LazyRifts Academy and we are, are making an amazing advanced shmup in phase two of our shmup tutorial. So, uh, what did we do last time? I feel like last time we introduced a couple of concepts that maybe we need a bit of a refresher a little bit. So let me, oh, as you can see, <laughs> I didn't delete the file here, I did some testing. I'm gonna go move, uh, load move. And we're gonna load our move prototype that we designed to kind of like test, you know, movement speeds and, and, and the feel of the weaponry and so forth and, and to make it, you know, the basics of the game. The basics of the game uh, feel nice to nail those basics because that's so important, so key to what we're about to do. Okay, so we have this little nice banking uh, plane uh, but the way the banking worked is something that was a bit weird and I kind of didn't really explain it, I feel. So maybe it's time a little bit to go back and, and explain what's happening here. Why do we have one as the lower value? That kind of makes sense. But why do we have 5,95 as a maximum value? That is a bit weird. And also, why is the center 3.5? These values refer to an animation array that we have, and that animation array has integer entries. It is entry one, two, three, four, five, and there's different uh, sprite numbers uh, in those integer slots. So why does the value that we're animating to create this animation, why does that value work with comma numbers and why there are so weird comma numbers. What's happening here? Let me try to demystify this thing. Let me set the animation speed to very low, 0 0.01. Now the banking animation is really slow. And to observe what's happening, I'm gonna also here, I'm gonna comment out this line. This line will stop our ship from moving. We're just gonna see what is, what is happening. Let's save this run. So we're seeing the banking animation playing very slowly and you observe that number in the top that is the actual animation that is playing this is the actual animation the value that we're animating to recreate those um, those individual animation frames and you know as we said we're basically stripping off the comma value and that is kind of like the number of the frame that we're showing as this ship is banking okay you can see it kind of like it wants to stay in the center at 3.5, not at three, even though three is the center, and is the center, uh, is the center frame. Why is that? Well, if we set the center to three, let's set the center to three. Let's see what happens then. Save run. Okay, first of all, <laughs> that is happening. Uh, let's set it to 3.1. Let's run this. Okay. So now if I press left, it will immediately, I'm pressing left now. You see, it will immediately um, animate to uh, like flip. It will immediately jump to the next animation frame. So it will immediately start to flip, even though an animation speed is set to very, very extremely low. I press the button now and it immediately flips. That's okay, that's actually what we want. We want a responsive animation, right? Like, what's the, what's the big deal? Well, if I press to the right, now, nothing happens for a very, very long time. So we got a responsive animation in one direction, but in the other direction, we have a very unresponsive animation. What, why is that? Well, the problem is kind of like the same, a little bit similar to the cobble stoning problem that, uh, that we had before. So if we imagine, let's just imagine, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is like a math class right now. So if I am, let me set it, let me choose a different color. Let's say I am here, I have, I, I'm exactly at three. I'm exactly at, at three. And we said like the animation speed is very slow. So every frame we're adding just a little bit, just a little bit of fraction or subtracting just fraction from that value. Where if I press to the left, what happens is, is, you know, we just going, just, let me show you, let me show you, let me, let me do it like with this. We're taking this, this, this cursor, we are exactly at three and we're pressing to the left. 
be just, just below three, just, just slightly below three. And then what we're doing is we're flooring it. We're flooring the value. And what flooring does is it strips out the comma value and we're just below three. So we're at two point comma something, so 2.9999999, right? So what it does, we immediately jump to two. Just a small animation will jump from three to immediately to two. Just like we're just, because we're right at the edge. We're right at the edge where one integer switches to the next integer. Contrary to that, if we go to the other direction, we just, just move a smidgen, a smidgen to the right, okay? A smidgen to the right. Well, nothing happens. We're still flooring it and, and it just returns back to three. Nothing happens. So let's wait a couple more frames. And if we wait a couple of more frames, dip, 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 dip. it takes a long time. It takes a couple of frames for this, this marker, the position where we're at, to actually jump to the next frame. It takes a long time. So the animation is not consistent. In one direction, it's incredibly responsive, good, but also the trade-off is that in the other direction, it's very unresponsive. And so that's why, that's why the actual center line I chose for our animation, the center line that the, the animation value returns to, I chose um, the center here at 3.5. That's the, our actual center that we're returning to, 3.5. Because from here, uh, if you're drawing, if you're staying from here, uh, then uh, to the, to the next animation frame, it's the same distance, right? Then whatever we're pressing left or right is going to be the same distance, so the animation will be it's equally responsive going to the left or right. Okay, and this also explains. This also explains why 5.9 is the maximum value. I, this is this maybe this is questionable actually. So I, I, I agree this could be, could have been done differently. So I said 5.9. So this is this is six, and this is like the edge. This is like where I set is the is the boundary of our animation one, and 5.9. Right? Like I said, I said 5.9. Is the is the edge? That's because again, if we said five is the is the edge, then you know uh, that animation frame would immediately disappear when we when we animate in a different direction. But that's not the behavior we see on the other side. On the other side, uh, uh, the edge is one, and when we start animating away from the edge, it takes a good while for that marker to reach the next animation frame. So to get like a consistent response on the uh, opposite edges of the animation uh, frame, of the animation loop uh, edge spectrum, <laughs> animation spectrum. Um, to get a similar response on both edges, um, I set it to 5.9, so it's kind of like similar to, you know, what we see on the other side. It's because, you know, the um, generally it's because the uh, floor behavior is not symmetrical, so we make it symmetrical by choosing always the center. It's exactly, it's kind of like this a similar problem that we had, kind of related to the problem that we had previously where we are experiencing this cobblestoning. And that was because, you know, we weren't exactly in the center of a pixel. We were kind of offset and that's why we get like, got like weird effects. Now I have to admit this is not exactly, maybe there's probably a slightly better way of doing this. I think like something like f doing it at five maybe. Let's, let's put it at five and the other at 1.9 to make the um, edge edges a little bit more responsive. So now, let me, let me, can we animate it all the way to the end? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so now, it, now it's at five and if I let go, it immediately jumps back. That's actually cool. That's actually what we want. We want the responsiveness. And now in this other direction, 1.9 and I let go then in you pretty much immediately animate back. That's probably a, a better a better edges that, that feel a bit more responsive. Uh, but you know, you do you. Oh man, now I forgot what was the banking speed before. Uh, z um, 0 0.5, okay. So let's just set back, set, set, reset everything. 0 0.9 and we're gonna go to five here. Let's go, let's, can we go with 0 0.95? Does that, does that look good? Ah, oh, that looks fine. Yeah, and then we keeping the 3.5 as a center value, I think that's good. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so we explained the weird numbers we had in the previous episode. Um, there is another thing I asked in a, in a doggy zone uh, last time around, which is uh, I, I was kind of like, I didn't really like these if statements, all these if statements that are just about, you know, the ship animation. There's a lot of code just to deal with the ship animation. So I ask you if we can somehow rewrite it to be a more, you know, more concise, a little bit more concise, and maybe use less tokens. I did rewrite it. 
So here's my solution here. I would maybe rewrite it to make it more concise. There's some downsides to it and we're gonna see it right away. First, let me write down the number of tokens we have right now. We're doing token optimization right now. <laughs> it's a bit too early to do token optimization, I have to admit. You know, you don't have to token optimize everything. Um, but these kinds of prototypes are kind of like nice to kind of like figure out really nice compact solutions. Sometimes you kind of find like a more concise way of expressing the same thing. And it's kind of like a good exercise uh, for, for the situation here to, to, to kind of like fix it. Because like if you have a lot of co this code lying around, it's, you know, eventually it gets really hard to, uh, to uh, add more elements to the code because there's just so much craft, you know, that you have to, you have to, do, uh, you have to go through. So let us just remove a little bit of the craft and, and, and make sure that this is, um, this is um, a bit more compact. Okay, so my solution here is to make this ship spur function, uh, to make this a little bit, uh, to make this variable that we're animating a little bit, um, to make it work a bit differently. Instead of um, this actually telling us which of the animation frames uh, from the sprite, from, the, from this animation array we are taking, Instead of this just relating directly to the uh, individual animation frames, uh, what about if this was just a measure of how far we are banking? And then we do some math to translate that measure into, into uh, the actual animation frame. So what I want to do is I want to maybe create an, uh, an animate an animation value that goes from minus one to mean, meaning banking in one direction, to zero, that's the perfect center, to plus one. Right, doing like an animation is like minus one to plus one, and then here when we're actually drawing the sprite, we're going to take this minus one to plus one and translate it into the individual animation frames. Okay, so let's try that. Let's just first lock down the animation for now because we are about to break a lot of things. We're going to break it down, uh, uh, lock it down so it's just always showing us there's no animation happening anymore. Okay. Um, then we're gonna start at zero, not along at 3.5. Zero is now our neutral for the for the banking. And this allows us, this allows us to here, when we're doing these kinds of things, we can, uh, the, the, the D ship spur, this can be, um, this can be that the default is zero. This is kind of like the destination to which we're animating that value. And you know, we want the D to default to zero because that's the neutral. That's where we're not banked at all. And now here, instead of this huge if, the else if, blah, 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 and we can just remove all of this here. And we can say something like D ship spur, that's the destination value, is just gonna be this. Just this, not quite this. So this is the X speed, this is the um, lateral speed of our ship. And kind of like, if you look at this, you know, this is kind of like going negative and positive. Like this is kind of like the X speed, not quite though. And we're gonna see why in a second. Uh, I can actually remove this already. I'm gonna keep the bank speed around. Um, and we're gonna see why in a second. So let me, uh, let me just, let me just also, let me just, this is we can comment, comment out. Let me just set the ship spur to D ship spur. And then we're gonna see we're gonna see what is happening. Uh, there we go. We're gonna sh set the ship spur to D ship spur, and we're plotting this on the, on the debug. So the lower number is now the D ship spur. Sweet. So it's now it's negative when we're going uh, left, positive when we're going right. Cool. One problem though, when we're going diagonally, because we're normalized diagonals, uh, it's it's <laughs> we're getting weird numbers. We're getting 0 0.7, not minus one and, and plus one. So we kind of have to turn, sometimes it's 0 0.7, we have to turn it into clear ones. How do we do that? Well, there is a function for that. And that function is called SGN, it is short for sine. So the sine function returns the sine of a, of a uh, variable uh, of, a, of, a, of a number. So if you're like minus 33, then that will just return minus one. If it's plus 33, then it will just return plus one. Uh, that's cool, that's exactly what we're looking because then we can turn minus 0 0.7, we can just turn it into minus one, and then plus 0 0.7 is gonna get turned into one. That's exactly what we're looking for. However, the SGN function in Lua, and, I th and as a result in, in PQ8, I think it's the same in Lua, I'm not sure, 
In Pico 8, it's working a bit wonky. It's not the way I expect it to work. I'm used to this function from other languages. And in other languages, there is one exception. If you do an SGN, the sign of zero, in other languages in, and also in my head, in, in my heart, <laughs> in my heart, <laughs> sign zero should be zero. That's, that's the way it should work for me. Like, because zero has no sign, so sign zero should be zero. That is not the case with Pico 8. Ugh. So sign zero will return plus one. It will just return one. Oh. That's not cool. Ew, ew. So um, yeah, we can we can see this is at work. Let's just see. Uh, let's see if this, we can actually see it. So um, mm, let me go here. I'm gonna go SGM sign of the speed of the hor horizontal speed of our of our ship. And let's 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 save this. So minus one, plus one, diagonal. Ooh, wait. Ah, <laughs> there we go. So it sometimes was zero because here, when we are not moving at all, then it will just default to zero. But when we, when we're moving just up, then we're gonna get the one, and that's not what we like. <laughs> For a second, <laughs> I thought like, wait, I mean, did they fix this? <laughs> uh, so sadly, something we have to do is something like I like to do and my sgn. We're gonna do a my sign function, and that will just return. I'm, I'm going to write the elaborate way and I'm going to show you a different way of writing this. So I'm going to go if v equals zero, then return v and then otherwise return sgnv. So we added this uh, this exception here. We added this exception that, you know, when v equals zero, then we are returning, uh, actually returning, yeah, we're returning zero. We could we just return zero. That is, that is a workaround. Um, we can write this a little bit more compact. And I don't know if we treated this, we talked about this in the basic schmuck tutorial, but we're gonna talk about this now. We're gonna talk about ternaries. Uh, could, could be also with Y. <laughs> if it's Y, let me know in the comment section. Ternary? Ternary. Ternary. That's the right spelling of it. Ternary operator. What is a ternary? Let, let me show you uh, like an, uh, overall idea what what is what 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 does this look like a equals b and c or d and this is equivalent this line is equivalent to if b then a equals c else a equals d this, this statement here, this if statement here, that's equivalent to this line. That's the same thing. And it's weird because we have and and or. That's, that's not how and and or work. Like this is <laughs> what is happening here. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's due to some weird quirks, the way and and or works in Lua, you can use those to create terms, what we call the ternary operator. Ternary operator is kind of like a compact if statement. Uh, that is kind of can be like like a one line if statement that is used in only certain uh, situations where we're just assigning value depending on a certain condition. Uh, in this case, you know, this just works in these kinds of cases where there's a variable that we're assigning assigning two different um, values depending on a certain condition. In this case, the condition is B, and there's certain there two values that we're assigning uh, between our C or D. So depending on if B is true or false, um, uh, we're gonna get assign C to A or D to A, C to A or D to A, depending on whether or not B is true. This is nice. This is, uh, first of all, it's kind of nice and compact. It's kind of nice that you have it in, in one line. It's kind of like really cool. Also like, look, this is, this is 10 tokens and the ternary here is not cool seven tokens. So we see, save three tokens. Again, token optimization is not a high priority right now, but um, it's kind of good to get in the practice of using ternary operators whenever you feel like you have to kind of like an opportunity to use them, uh, just because they make everything nice and compact and they save you, you know, every time you use them, you save them. It's, it's hard sometimes to find situations, like in, when you later on go through the code and optimize, it can be find, hard to find uh, situations where you can use a ternary. Let us take this and apply it to, to what we have here. We can just use a ternary operator to, 
To simplify this, so this is going to be my, my simplification here, we're going to do it directly in the return statement. So we're going to return um, v equals zero and zero or uh, SGN v. This one line, 10 tokens, is equivalent to this whole thing. 11 tokens, saved one token. <laughs> Yeah, so um, just to show you, like this V statement, if V equals zero, uh, that is the B in here, right? The zero, that is the C, and the SGNV, that is the D. And in this case, we're not assigning A, we're just returning it. Just a little and cool opportunity to learn about the ternary, the ternary operators. <laughs> I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sorry. It's, it's the, the, the name for it I learned just recently. I've been using it for a very long time, but uh, I just recently learned uh, how you call them. Okay, so now we can use this, our my sign function and replace the old sign function with my sign function. And now we should see, okay, this is working. Now when I press up and down, there is no banking happening anymore because zero returns zero as a sign, as a, the sign of zero is zero now, no longer one. Okay, wow, that was a long explanation, huh? Good, so now let us animate because this is the destination. We're just now just at like setting our animation to the destination immediately, but now we want to maybe like slowly animate it to the destination. So how do we do this? Well, again, we're gonna actually use the my sign function. Let me show you what I mean. So we're gonna do, we don't do it in all in one line. We're gonna do plus equals my sign um, the, the ship spur minus ship spur. And then we can multiply it by some value. I'm gonna multiply it by, let's multiply it by 0 0.1. Let's multiply it by a very, very small value. And then we can clamp it down afterwards to uh, minus one and one. Okay, I have to make sure that it stays within the region of minus one and one. Okay, let's see first if it works and then I'm gonna explain how it works. <laughs> okay, so you can see it goes left and right. Let me, let me stop the ship so we're no longer moving. So you can see it working. Yep, goes to minus one and then returns to zero. Uh, well, it's jitters around around zero, but it's fine. And then going up and it stays at one. Cool, it works. So wait, what is this, what is this huge gigantic uh, mathematical equation? So first of all, um, this is what happens first. Um, we take the destination, the value that we should animate towards, and we subtract uh, our current value from this. So to kind of like understand if we're going, if you're supposed to go, if you're supposed to make our current value smaller or if you make supposed to make it bigger. We don't know if where the destination is. Is it left or for you, is it right from, from where we're supposed to be or is it left from where we're supposed to be? And to, in order to do that, we, um, we calculate the difference. We calculate the difference between where we are and where we're supposed to be. That's our difference. And then we're not really interested how far we are from our destination. All we're really interested in is uh, in the sign of the difference, like uh, if we're going to the left or if we're going right. So that's why we're using, again, the sign function. We're just getting minus one or plus one, depending on if we should go left or right to reach our destination. And then we take that and multiply it by the speed. This is going to be now the speed at which we are, we're animating. And you can tell, but that if we set it to 0 0.5, I guess that was the like, kind of the values we had before. You can immediately see it switches immediately to one and minus one. And now it also don't no longer jitters because there is no rounding problems anymore. Let's set it to 0 0.1. Is that cool? Yeah, that's good. Cool. Uh, I don't like the jittering. There's probably a cool way of solving this, but okay. So we now have a value that animates between one and minus one. That's actually actually what we set out to do uh, here. Right, that's what we wanted to do. Now, I want to translate this value into actually one of the frames in our animation. So that's something we can do here. Um, we can do like a helper for, for a second here, helper. Um, so that is gonna be, oops. So we're gonna take the ship spur and we're gonna multiply it by some value and then we're gonna add another value, right? So we, now we just have to figure out those two values because now, right now it's, from minus one to one. So the range that, that we're animating at is um, is two. 
from minus one to plus one. Uh, and the range that our animation has is actually five. So we have to expand it. That's why we're multiplying it. And then the center line is at zero, but we don't want it to be at zero. We want it to be at, at, at well, at three technically, right? So we need to else add something. So let's start maybe with this. Actually, we don't want to add it three, as we said previously, the center is actually 3.5. So let's, let's set the 3.5 in here. We know that immediately. So all that is left to do is kind of like figure out the range. And as I said before, the range is actually five. And uh, like the, the range that we want to have is five, but the range that we have is two from minus one to two. So what we have to do is multiply by 2.5 because two times 2.5 is five. We want to have five, so we multiply by 2.5. Cool. Uh, I wanna get it down to 2.4 to kind of like account for rounding errors. And then one important thing is to floor it. I'm gonna floor it because we want an integer value. We don't want comma values. And then we're gonna dump that helper into as our animation sprite number, a uh, ship sprite number. So let's save this, let's run this. And as you can see, it's turning all right, sweet. Exactly what we wanted. Good, good. And let us make everything nice in line. We don't need that helper function anymore. Uh, that helper variable, we can just like replace it in here because we're not using it for anything else. And now everything is nice and peachy. Now let us do some cleanup. Is there some any kind of leftover that we need to get rid of? Yeah, this bank speed we can remove. And let's bring back the actual movement. And we arrived at uh, 223 tokens. We saved five tokens. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, you know, sometimes you do a lot of work and you don't save that much. The reason why we didn't save that much we actually did save a lot. The problem is the mind sign function. It's, it's uh, like that, that whole function is 14 tokens. Whenever you create a function, that's a very expensive thing. Functions are expensive, yo. Um, so we kind of want to make sure that we're going to keep this around, but we want to make sure that it's mind sign function that we can actually use it for other things as well. Then the savings are going to be real. But five tokens, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but it's not just the five tokens, to be honest. There is also. Um, there's also the added benefit. We don't have as much crafty anymore. Not, not so much if statements anymore. Everything is just like very, um, very compact lines. On the other hand, maybe not quite as readable for outsiders. We kind of, also outsider could be us in two years, you know? <laughs> and later on when we look at our code and we're just like not in the zone anymore, it's like, what are we doing? <laughs> So, you know, there's trade-offs to consider when you're working with code. Uh, what do you want to optimize for? Uh, I'm going to keep it around like this because that was a cool technique. We definitely want to use this later on in our final program. Right, so does that actually feel nice? Is that good? Yeah, I, I definitely see the animation. This is an important aspect of this whole thing. Can we, uh, can we just try to make it snappier even? Let's make it 0.2. Yeah, and maybe the snappiness. Yeah, and see, when I when I do this tap dodging thing, I want to make sure that it doesn't look wonky. So maybe let's see what if I do like this. Yeah, I don't know. I maybe zero point one five. Yeah, that that looks better. I think it's kind of like it's little tiny things that we're tweaking, but those things eventually add, add up to making a feel a game feel you know cool and good. Good. We wasted so much time on our episodes just like rehashing stuff from a past episode. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Let us try to get a bullet on the screen today, huh? How about that? Hi everybody, here's Christian from the future. Uh, just a quick reminder, um, we at this point completely forgot that there's still one thing that we planned. It was part of the doggy zone and that is, you know, the flame animation, the jets coming out of the engines of the jet. We kind of lost track of it because this episode was running already so long and Christian was really eager to just add something new to the table. Uh, but don't worry, we're going to come back to it next episode. Okay, so we are trying to create a situation where we're firing a bullet. Let us look at our mock-up. That's the nice thing about mock-ups. They kind of like tell you what to do. Okay, so this is our mock-up that we created back in the days. And you can see there I did actually uh, create some shots here. This is a very 
simple shot. We're gonna see how it looks. There's two bullets coming out of our ship at the same time, so it kind of like looks like a military jet. They're firing. I think they're firing from the fuselage usually. Like I saw Top Gun recently. Okay, <laughs> there's like bullets, uh, guns in the fuselage, and and so we try to get the bullets out of that kind of like left and right from the cockpit. Let's try to make this work. Okay, so uh, let us uh, draw a bullet. I'm gonna draw a bullet and it's, I'm not sure, like I haven't looked, but it, definitely using like this uh, orange yellowish bullet with a white center. So it kind of like there is a clear uh, front and back to the bullet. And yeah, and I'm gonna do, the, I'm gonna try to animate these bullets out of the ship. And we did that before, we did that before. This is not, this is not new stuff. Um, I'm gonna call it shot. Should we call it shots or shot? And let's call it shots. And then here in the update function, where's the update, update 60, um, here is where, where we're gonna do at the very end, we're gonna go if btn uh, x then. So here's where we're firing the bullets. Um, so we're gonna go uh, add shots, curly bracket, curly bracket, close curly. So now this is kind of like this first, if you do it like this, it just adds an empty empty object. We did that before, just wanna be clarified. Uh, so we're all on the same page. And now here we can just add, you know, inline values to this bullet uh, to create it. So first of all, hmm. Well, it needs an X position, definitely. It's gonna be something, <laughs> I'm not sure what. And uh, it's, it's definitely gonna need a Y position and it's gonna need a speed. So let's go this SX, speed X. Um, it technically doesn't need a Y, but we're gonna keep it around anyway, because maybe later on we're gonna have bullets that go in different directions, we don't know. Okay, let's fill it with some sensical values. Now X and Y, um, we, we're not really sure where we're firing the bullet from, but it's definitely something that is related to our ship. So let's just fire it from the ship's position and then we're gonna tweak it afterwards. So we're plugging PX and PY into our bullet starting position and we want the bullet to go upwards. Oh, actually, yeah, I made a mistake. Uh, SX is something that you could drop out because the bullet is only moving vertically, but we're gonna add SX anyway. Um, because again, maybe we're gonna have diagonal bullets at some point, just keep it around, why not? And then we're gonna go, this vertical speed of the bullet is gonna be minus one because it's going upwards, it's going towards the smaller Y position numbers, right? Uh, okay, and then we just need a function, we're gonna create a function, and then remember, every, every time you create a function, you're losing some tokens, so <laughs> we wanna make sure later on that we kind of like really question whether we really want to have um, a function or not. In this case, we probably do. So we're gonna go call this function do sh do bullets or oh, do shots. Let's go do shots. Shots, shots, shots. <laughs> um, and we're gonna go for s in all shots do. And then we're gonna go s dot um, x plus equals s dot x y. And x dot y equals uh, no s uh, s y uh, like this. Okay, <laughs> I'm a bit confused today. <laughs> okay, so this is just taking the speed of each shot, each um, bullet, uh, and it's just adding that value to the x and y position of the bullet. That's all it does, and then we can we do it directly in the draw function. And I know I'm not consistent, but I don't have to be consistent. Uh, here, um, the question is whether we draw the ship above our bullets or below our bullets. I think it makes sense to draw the bullets below the ship. Uh, but first of all, let's break it above the ship so we can see them. So um, yeah, after we draw the ship, that's where we draw the ship. Uh, then we are going through all of the shots and we're just gonna do an SPR here. SPR uh, 11. And an s dot x, s dot y. That's it. Well, something is happening. We can draw bullets on the screen. 
Oh, look, we see our beautiful, perfect stair patterns. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, we are. <laughs> we made a mistake. Rooney, of course, we didn't do the do shots in the update functions. Let's do the do shots in the update function. Uh, let's put it in here. Yeah. Now we are firing the shots a little bit too fast. They're creating those smudges, right? So we don't want to create those smudges. Um, so we can do something like a sh short wait. Uh, this is going to be like a wait function. Um, and I saw, <laughs> I saw, <laughs> and I, I realized, I, I watched Actane doing his, his, uh, his Schwab, shout out to Actane. And he, I think he used a BTNP there. Let me, let me try this. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> you can do this with BTNP. <laughs> so that's a solution to that. So BTNP is it kind of like triggers that function only once in that frame when you actually press the button. But also the button has this kind of like behavior that you have in text editors as well, that where you keep the button pressed, it waits for a short moment and then it re-triggers in a, at a certain pace. So that's how, we, for example, when you're writing something and you want to repeat something, like you can show it here. Like I'm pressing A. I can write a lot of A's by just by just keeping the button pressed. And what Actain did is he there's ways of modifying this behavior using peaks and pokes, using poking into the memory, and Actain actually went ahead and, and changed the shot frequency. <laughs> by poking around and changing that repetition behavior to harness this for um, <laughs> for his shot mechanics, which is amazing, ingenious, love it. Um, but uh, it is a bit janky, we have to say. It is a bit of a, wow. <laughs> um, we are going to use our own system for this. And maybe that's not wise. Maybe actually Tain was right. Um, so when we add a shot, we're going to go shot, we're going to go shot weight uh, equals Let's, let's wait 30 frames, all right? And then we're gonna go, if shot weight is smaller or equal zero then. So only if there's a countdown timer happening that we are doing, and if the countdown timer is at zero, only then we are firing our bullet. So now we should be able to fire one bullet. And now no longer, because now we set the countdown time to 30, but we don't have a way to count down, right? So we are going to do something like, uh, sh uh, let's go if short weight is greater than zero, then short weight minus equals zero. And you know, there's probably a re argument for making it not an if statement, but just like letting it go. The problem is like, if we let it go, you, if you wait long enough, it will go lower than 32,000 and then it will become incredibly high positive and then you cannot shoot anymore. <laughs> That's the only reason why we might actually. There's, there's also maybe a reason for me. We could also do a... Ah, just leave it like this. It's fine. I'm not going to optimize right now. So now if I keep pressed, nothing actually happens. Why? Let us, let us, let us print the short wait. Let's... let's Let's see what happens. Oh, it doesn't actually count down. Why? Oh, minus equals zero. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so now the shot frequency is 30. Uh, and we can now get the shot frequency down. So now you can see the shot frequency is a bit, a bit, a bit higher. What about 10? Yeah, now it's kind of all about finding the right shot frequency and so forth. Okay, so let's stop here and let us actually go to the doggy zone. That's right, to the doggy zone. All right, so in the doggy zone, you have all that you need. We have set up the fundamentals for you to create your own shots. And I want you in the doggy zone to actually experiment with this and try to design your own shots that look and feel Awesome. Now, in the pr uh, basic Schmop tutorial, we went through this, uh, that already. We kind of like already talked about, you know, what makes a shot awesome and what are the things that you want to be looking at. Here should could be also a good opportunity to actually do some research and actually go out and play some shmups and look exactly what do the bullets look like, you know, how do they behave, you know, what what does maybe pick a, a shmup 
that you feel has a really cool shot and try to replicate it with the system. Maybe you can figure out some ways out. Things that I want you to uh, to watch out for. First of all, we had double shots here, like in our mock-up were double shots. So let's do double shots. Then maybe modifying the speed, like seeing what happens when the bullets move faster and modifying the frequency. What is a good speed and frequency? These two things are related. Then also maybe thinking about redesigning the bullet, maybe a different kind of bullet would be better for what we're trying to achieve. Not necessarily the thing that we had in our mock-up, but actually something that feels good. And as I said, maybe we can implement the shot limit to see how that feels like. And of course, and that's kind of like really advanced, but because you really have to get into the subject matter, as we always said, if you're creating a shot, you also should create a muzzle flash. So this is also going to be our next step. So go ahead and try creating a muzzle flash. Yes, and also at this point, I will say a big thank you to all the people on coffee.com who are supporting this show. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the major perks is that if you're a supporter, you can see the subsequent episodes earlier before they're being released on YouTube. So you could watch episode seven right now. Coffee.com slash lazy devs. Yes, 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 yes. We are, we wasted a lot of time in this episode, but sometimes it's good to kind of slow down a little bit so we can jump straight to the next topic. Next episodes are all going to be about tweaking those bullets, making an awesome shot. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.